Okay, so we are still looking at differential equations, and in particular we're still looking at linear independence and the run scheme. Okay, so it says, right here, this is all very ad hoc. We have used different approaches to different problems for different types of functions. Right, here we just happen to know this trig identity. Um, and here, here we subbed in values for the polynomials, because we, because we knew the zeros of the polynomials. And we'd like to develop a more systematic way of checking for independence. Consider, uh, no, not a function. That's not a function. That's a set, isn't it? Consider a set. Consider a, a set of functions called f, which equals has two functions in it, f1 and f2. Is it linearly independent on the interval i? Okay. Well, you look at you're going to be looking at this equation, right? The linear com is the linear combination. You set the linear combination. You let set the linear combination equal to zero, and then you try and you try and see if it has non-zero solutions. Now you could differentiate both sides of this equation. You get, of course, alpha one f one dash plus alpha two f two dash, right? Equals zero. This is a system of linear equations, though, right? You can rewrite this as a matrix equation, where the matrix has the first column being f1, f1 dash, second column being f2, f2 dash, multiplied by the vector a1, a2, equals the vector 0. OK. Well, that's, of course, you can write that compactly as m times alpha equals 0. So alpha, alpha is the vector alpha1, alpha2, and M is the matrix F1, F1 dash, F2, F2 dash. So you know that's a matrix of functions. So that matrix has different numbers for every value of X. Okay, but that's fine. If the matrix M is invertible, then alpha does equal zero, right? We're looking to see when does this have, we're trying to look to see when does this equation, this homogeneous linear equation, this homogeneous matrix equation, when does it have non-trivial solutions, when does it only have trivial solutions, and we know already that it'll, if the only time, it, the time it will have only trivial solutions is when that matrix is invertible, okay? The, the matrix is invertible, then alpha equals zero. The only solution to 3.1 is alpha one equals alpha two equals zero, so the set is linearly independent. Consequently, if we can find some value, x naught, in the interval, so that the determinant of m is non-zero at x naught, then f is linearly independent. Okay, so we, see, we only need one value, x naught, because if we just find that one value, then we calculate basically m x naught, okay, which is f1 x naught, f2 x naught, f1 dash x naught, f2 dash x naught, okay. Now suppose that has a non-zero determinant, okay, if that has a non-zero determinant, well, Sorry, we want to know, is that mx0 invertible or not? Because if it, if it is invertible, okay, even just for that one value, then we can invert it at that value, and we'll get alpha equals, you know, the inverse of that m. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm actually just going to call this m, not mx0. I like they've done. Okay, that inverse of m times naught, which is just naught, right? And see, these alphas... The alpha, the alphas, they must work for every value of x, right? So if at one x naught you find that they have to be zero, then that means that they have to be zero at every value. Because of course zero, zero does work for every value, right? There always is the trivial solution, but now this bit is saying, this bit is saying, at x naught only the trivial solution is good enough, and if if only the trivial solution is good enough at x naught, then that forces it to be the alphas to be alpha 1, alpha 2 at x naught, well, the alpha 1, alpha 2 are the same for every value of x because alpha 1, alpha 2 are just chosen for the functions, not for the particular values, not for the inputs of the functions. Okay. So all you have to do is find one value in the interval where this M matrix is... where this M matrix is invertible... And you'll, you'll know then that the set is 
the set of functions is linearly independent. Okay. Um, all right. And of course, to tell us something is invertible, you just check to see whether its determinant is zero or not. If its determinant is, if its determinant is not zero, then it's invertible. Okay. So now we have this definition. The Ronskian of a set f, which consists of functions f1, f2 to fn, which is denoted by w of x, may be defined on an interval i where all the functions are at least n minus 1 times differentiable. And, uh, and what, is it? what is it? Well, the Ronskian is the determinant of this matrix where the first column, where the first row is f1, f2, all the way to fn. So it's an n by, determinant of an n by n matrix. So the first, first row is f1, f2, fn, and so on. Sorry, f1, f2, f3, and all the way to fn. Then the second row is the derivatives of all of those, f1 dash, f2 dash, all the way to fn dash. And the third row is the second derivatives, and the fourth row is the th third derivatives, until you get to the nth row, which is the n minus one derivatives. Okay, that's why the functions have to be differentiable n minus one times, because you have to be able to do this, right? You know, sometimes you get functions that are, that, that's where the, func some functions don't have derivatives, right? Or the, if it, if it does have a derivative, maybe its derivative doesn't have a derivative, okay? For example, um, functions that aren't continuous, right? Won't have derivatives. Or the absolute value function doesn't have a derivative, okay? I mean, it has, doesn't have a derivative if the interval includes the place where it has that kink, okay? So this is the wrong skin, this determinant of this matrix, okay? Now, we have a fact, if there is an x naught in the interval, so that w x naught is not equal to zero, then this matrix is invertible, and so there, are, there is only the zero solution to this linear combination of the functions, and thus the set f, which is the functions, is linearly independent on the interval, on the interval i, right? Because, of course, we're considering these functions on the interval i, right? Okay. Now, this is, this is clearly just a generalization of this, this uh, two by two case, which we proved here, right? We worked that out. So the idea is the same as the two by two case, and we can extend it to larger sets by induction. So basically, if you want to try and prove for n by n, we'd start by proving it for, you've already proved it for two by two. So what you'd do is you'd, in effect, you'd show how you can prove it for three by three using the fact that it's true for two by two. You can prove it for four by four using the fact that then you prove it for three by three. In general, you prove it for n, n by n, or a set with n vectors in it by proving it for, by showing that if it's true for n minus one, then it's true for n. And then of course, it's true for, every, true for all n. But we, there's no need to go through that proof. There's no need to try and do that proof. Okay. All right. Although a non-zero Ronskian implies linear independence. Linear independence does not imply that the wrong skin is non-zero at any point. Okay, so this test, this test, it'll tell you, if you find that the wrong skin is non-zero at a point, then you know that the set is independent, okay? But sometimes you won't find the wrong skin non-zero at any point and the set will still be linearly independent. So, this, this bit is saying, wrong skin at some x naught, not zero, implies linear independence, okay? But linear independence does not imply that there's some place where the Ronskian is not zero, okay? So this test will sometimes fail to tell you if the set, the set might be linearly independent but this, but this test doesn't tell you that, which is unfortunate. Okay. Similarly, a Ronskian that is zero everywhere does not imply linear dependence. Okay. So you could have Ronskian zero everywhere. Okay. But 
but that does not imply linear dependence, okay? So, the only thing we have is that if the Ronskian is not zero at a certain point, then we know the set is linearly independent. If we find that the Ronskian is if we find that the Ronskian is zero everywhere, so it's not, it isn't non-zero at any point, then that doesn't imply the opposite. That doesn't imply linear dependence. Okay? And if we have, and, and furthermore, yeah, it doesn't imply linear, linear dependence. It could still be linearly independent, these two things. These two, these two statements are related. That's why it says similarly, okay? So you've got to be careful with this test. Sometimes this test can fail, okay? Consider the set F, which equals X squared, and then this function, this funny function, X times the absolute value of X. We can show that this set is linearly independent on R by solving this equation, okay? The linear combination of those two functions equals zero. Okay, now if X is greater than zero, then the you know, equation becomes, if x is greater than zero, then of course the equation becomes alpha x squared plus beta x squared equals zero, right? Because then the x is just, the absolute value of x is just equal to x when x is greater than zero. And so that means that alpha equals minus beta. But if x is less than zero, then we're going to have that the absolute value of x equals negative x, to, you know, to flip the sign. And so then you're going to get alpha x squared minus beta x squared equals zero, so alpha equals b. Okay, so if we have alpha equals minus b and alpha equals b, those two things, the only solution to those two equations together is alpha equals b equals zero. So that means the set is linearly independent. Okay. Now we're going to test the just check the Ronskin. Okay, so. If we recall that the derivative of x times the absolute value of x is 2 times the absolute value of x, okay, let's check that. So, how do we work out x, the derivative of x times the absolute value of x? Okay, so, what? The derivative of absolute value of x, okay, the derivative of the absolute value of x, that's equal to, what, it's equal to, it's equal to x over the absolute value of x, except not at zero, where it's not defined, okay? Um, which is actually the same as absolute value of x over x, okay? This equation is only, but this derivative is only defined when x is not equal to zero. So if we want to calculate the derivative of this, well, let's calculate, first of all, let's calculate it when x is not equal to zero. So you're going to use the product rule. So the derivative of, the derivative of x is one, so then you just have the absolute value of x. And the, then we have x and the derivative of absolute value of x is, now I'm going to use the expression absolute value of x over x. Okay, and so the x those two x's there cancel out, and we just get two times the absolute value, absolute value of x. But of course, this whole thing this is when x is not equal to zero, right? What about when x is equal to zero? So we're looking at this x absolute value of x, right? So we want to know calculate the derivative. We want to know the limit as x goes no, the limit. As h goes to zero, mm, no, let's have a limit as um, limit is maybe as what well, the derivative at zero. So we want to look at yes, let's have the limit as h goes to zero of x absolute the value of x minus oh no sorry x plus h, absolute value of x plus h, minus, and then x, absolute value of x, all over h, okay? This would be, this is this is the derivative. We actually want the derivative at x equals zero, 
now, because we've already found it through other arguments, not considering the limit directly, through we've already found the one is when it's, x is not zero. So at zero, we're going to have h, the absolute value of h, then that's zero, and then here we have h, okay, and that equals the absolute value of h. Oh, that equals the limit as h goes to zero of the absolute value of h, which does equal zero. Okay, so we're saying that the derivative at of this function x absolute value of x at zero is zero. So that means that we can continue using this formula because this formula is also zero at zero. Okay, so this is why the derivative of x absolute value of x is two times the absolute value of x. Okay, all right, so this is the derivative of that. Then the Ronskin is going to be x of x squared, the set x squared, x absolute value of x is going to be x squared, 2x derivative of that, x absolute value of x, and then 2 absolute value of x. Okay, and so take calculate that derivative, you get 2x squared times absolute value of x minus 2x squared times absolute value of x, and that's equal to zero. So the Ronskin is zero everywhere, okay? So we can't apply the test that says if the Ronskin is non-zero at a point, then the set is linearly independent, okay? So we can't conclude from the Ronskin test that this set is linearly independent, but we actually already know from this other arguments, from inspecting directly and solving directly for alpha and beta, that the set is linearly independent. So this is an example where the Ronskin test fails. This example makes it clear that in general the implication in fact 3.4 runs in only one direction. Okay, so that's what I was saying here. The, the, the implication goes in that direction, it does not go back. It can be shown that if the set F is a set of solutions to a linear homogeneous differential equation, then the implication runs in both directions. Oh, okay. So, if that set F is not just any set of functions, but it's the set of solutions to a linear homogeneous differential equation, okay, which is what we've been studying in the previous section, then the implication does run in both directions. Okay. I think I'm going to leave it there.